Thank you very much, Steph. It's great to have an insight into what your ID trainers have been up to. Uh, continuing on that theme, I'm now going to hand over to Steph West and John Tweddle, who are going to tell you more about uh, the scheme. Okay, thanks. <coughs> Right, um, I'm going to start off as possibly any good talk should with an apology. Uh, for once, it's not going to be about me waffling on, it's going to be about the sound of my voice. Uh, but a couple of days ago, I'd have been doing this talk by the means of interpretive dance. So uh, you'll have to forgive me for croaking at you a little bit through this. Um, so Steph's given us a great introduction as to uh, what it's like to be one of our trainers, trainees sorry, on the Identification Trainers for the Future project. I'm going to tell you a little bit more about the depth of the project. And um, while I'm not going to be telling you too much about the biological recording data aspect that our trainees are, or are already doing and have gone on to do after their traineeship. We're talking a little bit about perhaps some of the data uh, that we've brought from, uh, from doing the traineeship. So um, the core project wasn't just the traineeship itself. Um, so for those of you who haven't come across the project at some point in the last three years, hopefully you all have, uh, but it's a heritage lottery funded project um, looking at a way that we can build or well, bridge the skills gap in biological recording, particularly through loss of identification skills, for some of our more cryptic taxa in the UK. So we've been working with Field Studies Council and the MBN um, to try and develop a new way of looking at some of the issues around that. Aside from just the traineeship itself, we've been um, working towards providing training for up to a thousand people. Uh, providing training resources coming out of the project as well and looking at a few other elements of recruiting particularly within the sector so looking at particularly workforce diversity and how we actually encourage people to come into uh, bodice recording and identification. Steph's already given you a great introduction to the traineeship itself and some of the actual uh, recording training and identification training we've been doing. Um, so we've been working with curators from around the museum to try and build up new courses, new workshops um, around identification skills. But also looking at this is a very much a work-based opportunity for our trainees. Um, Steph's already mentioned time with curation uh, teams, uh, working with uh, the museum's learning engagement uh, teams, and also working with us in the AMC. And I mentioned one of the key issues for us was about recruitment. Now. For us, we really wanted to try something quite different here. The standard model for recruitment into um, the museum is pretty much the standard recruitment you'd expect anywhere else. You get a job advert, you have a, uh, an application form, and in a standard one to a terrifying panel kind of interview. Um, when you're actually looking at recruiting for a position like a traineeship, where you can potentially get a lot of um, applicants, and also can be dealing with people from a really wide background, and we wanted as wide a background within our applicants as possible. You really want to try something different. So um, we basically upset our HR department um, <coughs> and tried something completely new. Particularly with our selection process, we did no one-to-one -one interviews. We, had, we, we didn't terrify anybody in the headlights of sitting in front of a panel. Um, we actually had all of our uh, selected candidates in on one day. We had 25 people in at once. They all did group-based activities, um, some of which they developed previously, um, others which we kind of threw at them a little bit of the day, on the day, um, and challenged different aspects of how they might deal with a fast-paced, really high-pressure um, uh, situation such as a traineeship. And it actually worked extremely well. Obviously, I mean, I may be completely biased, but we've managed to recruit some pretty fantastic trainees over the last three years. Um, but also we've been able to um, engage with and, and hopefully continue to support an awful lot of other people just through the selection process as well. As I mentioned previously, one of the things we were also looking at was the question of diversity and recruitment into our sector. And we know that our sector is particularly poor, particularly around things like um, so, uh, recruitment from low socioeconomic income, uh, backgrounds and also from um, ethnic uh, minority backgrounds as well. And this gives you some of the baseline statistics that we've been able to draw together um, from various organisations and ourselves as the museum over the last three years. And you can see that actually in comparison to the UK as a whole, the UK biodiversity sector doesn't really stack up in these terms and we know this. 
So this is, this is what our data is looking like. Now we've done, um, we've tried various methods over the last three years to try and encourage and enthuse more people to see um, this as a possible career, as a possible interest area. Um, and we've, we've made some inroads. We've, we've done, a, we've done um, particularly in year two, where we really targeted um, particular groups going out into communities and speaking to people and actually engaging and encouraging people to, to see natural history as something not only that we're passionate in, but that anybody can be passionate and excited about. And actually started to see some, some progress there. And that's something we really want to work on further in the future. But as for our trainees themselves, these are our 15 trainees from the programme. Um, as you can see, a fantastic bunch, and actually really, really grateful to have uh, representatives from all three years here um, at the conference at the moment, which is really great. So if you haven't come up and spoken to all of the trainees yet, make sure you come up and find everybody at lunch and have a good chat to them about what they're doing. Um, some of the data. So Steph showed you some of the fantastic photographs um, of what it looks like to be on our traineeship, but actually what was that training actually all about? Now, in terms of identification training, over three years we've delivered 62 natural history workshops. Now, those are brand new workshops which have been developed purely for this programme by our curation, curation research teams, principally. Um, so that's something that we're really excited about. And that's been delivered by 33 of the museum's experts who have come in and engaged with um, the AMC and with training. In some cases, for the very first time, and even those trainers who come in and done courses for the first time have never had that teaching experience, um, have really enjoyed it and actually we're starting to collate some of that information now on how they thought that went and it's all been extremely positive and basically they want to do more, which from um, my perspective is great because um, I want them to do a lot more as well. Um, not only have we done identification workshops with the trainees, we've also looked a lot at their employability skills as well. So we've delivered 48 employability skills um, uh, workshops as well, whether or not that's from how to write CVs uh, for the ecology sector, um, how to deal with interview situations, um, or look at some of the softer skills like project management, report writing, that sort of thing. And it's not just been training for our little group of 15 trainees. We've invited lots of other people into our workshops as well, and we've had 172 participants who've come in from outside of the museum into our training workshops as well. So we've been able to communicate what we've been doing and share um, a lot of that with other people as well, which is all, from, from the museum's perspective, fantastic. One of the key things which has come out to me um, across the uh, conference uh, this week has been the importance of collaboration and working with partners. And we really couldn't have delivered this project without our partners as well, the MBN and the FSC. They've been incredibly important contributors to our trainees' um, experience, taking them outside of the museum and experiencing different organisations, different ways of working, um, and things which simply as a museum we don't do, which is great, and we're very grateful for them to giving our trainees that opportunity. Steph mentioned some of the, um, some of the uh, outreach events that we've been doing. Um, and we've been uh, uh, really grateful that we've been invited out to an awful lot of places. Actually, over the last three years, um, we've, uh, either, we've had some form of presence at 18 conferences, at 22 uh, large-scale public events or bioblitzes. We've run training for our own teaching projects like Decoding Nature and engaged with about 120, 130 students um, as part of that. Um, we've delivered training courses at um, Gilbert White's Museum over in Hampshire, and our trainees have delivered their own workshops in the AMC. The interesting one for us was an opportunity to uh, work on a documentary um, for BBC Four. Um, and in terms of our um, outreach statistics, that kind of blew everything else that we've done out of the water. Um, because we had 1.2 million views of that documentary um, over the uh, course of not only when it was live on TV, but uh, the month that it was on iPlayer, which is um, quite terrifying and astounding. Um, but a great opportunity to actually get out uh, there a little bit more what we've been doing uh, with the traineeship and also the importance and value of recording that wildlife that's right on your doorstep as well. Um, oh, why is it saying PowerPoint stopped working on the computer? <laughs> Let's hope that's a lie. No, hang on. I think it might have fixed it. No. Good. So it came the same PowerPoint stopped working and now it's stopped working. Ah. <laughs> Great. <laughs> so it's 
So maybe I should have done the OHPs after all. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, um, so one of the things our trainees have been doing is producing a lot of final projects, and these are just starting to rattle through our system. Again, we've been working with the FSC to actually publicise some of these. So this one's actually on the Tomorrow's Biodiversity website, which is an uh, introductory key to uh, British grasses. Um, you may have seen Chloe uh, working with Bumblebee Conservation Trust briefly, um, building a, a new guide to uh, Shrill Cardaby. And out on the... Uh, stands uh, just outside we've got um, information about our uh, guide to vegetative identification of British, or uh, you know, British orchids uh, which is a fantastic document please make sure you go and have a look at that if you're into orchids because it's great um, and we've got loads more coming up soon uh, one of the most recent ones was Joe's looking at black east clovers and allies but we've got lots more coming out and there's loads of information on the stands to some of the publications that will be coming out soon of course the most important part of training um, is not just the end of the training but what happens to our trainees. And all 10 of our trainees who so far finished on the programme um, are all now completely employed and engaged with natural history recording uh, within the UK. Uh, this is our first year's group of trainees. I've uh, got Mike at London Wildlife Trust as um, one of their ecologists. Uh, Anthony, who is lurking somewhere at the back of the room, who now works for Earthwatch. Um, Katie looking fantastic in Greece when she was working for Operation Wallacea, but she's now back at the Natural History Museum working in our uh, Paleoptera department. Chloe's job is pretty obvious from the photo she sent me. And Sally down at the bottom uh, works up in Sheffield for the uh, Don Catchment uh, River Trust. And our year two group, we actually have three of them back at the museum. We like our trainees so much that we really want to keep them. Uh, so we've now got Nikki, Joe and Jazz working back in the museum. Christina's just started working for Natural England and Sophie over at the Hampshire Wildlife Trust. The most important element out of that, actually, I think, is making sure that we don't lose that connection. Over 12 months, we build a fantastic connection with our trainees, and it's really important to continue that. And that's one of the things which I personally have learned an awful lot from doing this project. Our trainees have been incredibly important to the museum. They've influenced a lot of what we do. Um, in, in terms of our ways of working, not just in recruitment, but actually how we deal with training in the museum. And part of that is the importance of mentoring and that ongoing mentoring, not losing track of people, keeping the group together as a cohort so that they can communicate and learn from each other and develop that peer group um, support, but also supporting them ourselves, continuing to mentor, mentor them after they leave, continue to work on their CVs, their, their um, continuing professional development, giving them occasionally that little bit of lift and a bit of nudge and support when, do you know what, that last interview didn't go as well as it could have done, and then the next one's coming right up. And actually being there for them is incredibly important, and that's something we really want to continue to look at how we can support people through that. We're working on the evaluation at the moment, um, and that's, that's our next steps. Coming soon, you're going to start seeing more reports coming out from the museum. Um, we're going to be producing a document which looks at the lessons that we've learned from doing this over the last three years. And we're also going to be running a seminar um, around the middle of next year um, where we can actually get, hopefully, um, several of you guys to come in and talk to us about how we can help support early career natural historians, particularly a little bit more going forward. And at that point, I'm going to hand on to John before I lose my voice completely again. <laughs> Okay, so I'm John, I'm the head of the Centre for UK Biodiversity at the museum, where this project's based. I'm conscious of time, so I'm going to skip through this. Uh, we're around over lunch, so come and talk to us if anything kind of piques your interest or you've got any ideas. So I was just going to put ID trainers into a slightly broader museum perspective and start to look at the legacy and the next steps, but also to ask for your support and um, invitation to fill in another survey, a bit of a theme for the conference. Um, but just so we can make sure that as we go forward, we're really meeting the sector's needs, not just our own. So I'm just going to rattle through this very quickly. Um, training in UK biodiversity identification skills, field survey skills and monitoring skills is, is a big deal at the museum, as you'd expect. And we're working on a very tiered approach. So starting from the initial, can we spark that interest in people, our visiting public, the schools we work with, through to how we can develop the skill sets, um, all the way up to professional careers. ID trainers fit somewhere in the middle of that. 
And a lot of this is based or focused through the Centre for UK Biodiversity, where Steph and I are based. For those of you who don't know too much about us, we're a small team, seven of us, um, and we're really working to look at how we can most effectively, as a national museum, support the, the wider public to appreciate and understand the UK's natural history and support people to develop the skills and get involved in biological recording, help us in the room here to better understand and protect the UK's biodiversity. Operate in two ways, and again, I'll skim through. We're a resource centre for naturalists of all abilities. Um, we, we tailor our offer, offer to the individuals that come in to work with us, constantly updating the resources we have, and you can skim through some of the things on the slide there, and Steph mentioned this earlier as well. But we also run a very wide range of projects, um, projects spanning the, the initial information and engagement, so public events around UK natural history, through to identification and training resources for complete beginners, kind of spiders in your home kind of material, um, through to high level keys and guides, training and some information resources that really underpin a lot of the sector. So the UK Species Inventory, Chris is here with us today, he runs this, that provides the naming for the MBN Atlas, almost tripped up, um, and a wide range of other projects. So we're really looking at how we can take people from that initial interest through to a dedicated recorder, a professional naturalist. So I thought I'd put up a few stats just to let you know how I've got on over the past four years. So the year before ID trainers through till now, I won't go in detail, but just wanted to really highlight that there's a huge amount of interest in UK natural history out there. It takes time to make that effort to meet people, to train them in different ways. And with different audiences, of course, we have to take very different approaches. But it's quite an uplifting, positive thing. And we've heard this quite a lot in other talks. Um, there is a lot of public interest. Um, so just wanted to focus on two elements of this slide. Um, so on the left of the slide, uh, the two boxes there, is about how many people have been using us as a resource centre for naturalists. Um, so around about 1,000 people come through a year, most of whom are volunteer naturalists in some way beginners through to the absolute world experts, actually. But we also work closely with artists and students. Um, and over 40 different natural history organisations and groups from the voluntary and professional sector use us as their London base in many ways. It's just what we should be doing as a museum. We're really passionate about this. But a couple of observations around that is we're way below capacity. And we can support a lot more than 4,000 people over four years. Uh, you can probably raise that by 50% without breaking Chris's team, I think. Um, so. A couple of challenges we've got. We're based in South West London. Not everyone wants to get to South West London or can afford to get to South West London. So going forward, we're looking at how do we share the resources we've got in a more open way across the country, through other partners or online. And that's kind of a, an open question at the moment. And also, it's been really hard for us to promote what we do, which shouldn't be that hard. But we're still meeting lots of people, even in London, natu a dedicated naturalists who haven't heard of us who, once they have heard of us, will come in, access our collections and resources. So that's something just to bear in mind going forward, where we'd like to really up our game. And the other side really is on the other side of the slide, um, where it's got some big numbers. Big numbers of usually people new to natural history, um, involved in our public inquiry service, we identify things with them, face-to-face -face events in citizen science. Um, and this is great. This goes back to the idea that there's a huge amount of enthusiasm and interest for the field of natural history. What we're doing is we have, and I just want to really highlight, we've got an active research program around this to look at, okay, that's great on the day. We know people are enthused, we can have on the day evaluation, but what happens afterwards? So how do we track the effectiveness and improve the effectiveness of a face-to-face -face engagement with the scientists on the people we're working with, so on their attitudes towards science, their behaviours going forward, and importantly for this audience, how do we, com well, Convert sounds too top down. How do we support as many people as possible to go on as biological recorders going forward? And we've got a really active research program around this I'm happy to share with you. So, pretty sure we're almost out of time. Um, just a couple more minutes. Um, just, just to really start looking forward. So, Legacy of ID Trainers, um, we were very clear from the start this wasn't going to be a project that was funded and then disappeared. Um, had to have a permanent legacy within the museum or certainly a long term legacy. The challenges that have been highlighted today by, by Mark and actually Matt earlier are still there around conservation of UK biodiversity, engaging people in this. What ID Trains has done from a museum perspective is to move it from something that the Centre for UK Biodiversity does to a core strategic priority. It's one of our three strands of programming across the UK going forward for at least the next five years. We just work in five year cycles, it will be beyond that as well. So we're really looking at how we can continue taking people from that initial, initial inspiration through to dedicated naturalists. We'd love to do that together. Pretty much everything we do is collaborative. I'm really interested in your viewpoints on this. 
couple of legacies that will help us with this for ID trainers is we've got a new post in the museum now, a new permanent role, which is UK Biodiversity Training Manager, not something we've had before. Steph West is currently in that role, um, which is excellent news for us, and Steph will be taking this forward. And we're also looking to build on the enthusiasm of the, those, the tutors involved in this, as Steph mentioned earlier, the partnerships we've developed. Um, and I guess the only other element is we've now got a diversity working group across the whole museum looking at how we can really, as a whole museum, how can we support diversity within natural history sciences. And again, we can chat about that over lunch. So, before I get pulled off by a shepherd's crook or equivalent, a um, couple of areas to get involved in. Um, just to stress again, this is a really active priority for the museum going forward, and we'd like to do this together. One of the things we're just working on at the moment is how we can expand out from the little hub that's the Centre for UK Biodiversity, so that across our galleries, across our outdoor spaces, and across our teams in the museum, we're really looking at how we can best support UK biodiversity engagement, training, and study, with the aim of active applied conservation at the end point of this. So it's this targeted work. Um, We'll support this with big public engagement events. So we've got a dinosaur, well, a model dinosaur called Dippy. Dippy's going on tour. Dippy's coming to Wales, actually, uh, the Welsh Assembly. Um, we'll be using this to start a mass public engagement approach across the whole of the UK with multiple partners to really inspire people to think about their own lateral environments, where they live, work with the organisations, volunteering professional nearby. And I guess the final bit, really, is I mentioned before, we don't want to do this on our own in case we miss some of the targets that the rest of the sector needs. So we're in the process of putting together a five-year strategy for the Centre for UK Biodiversity as a whole, um, but also for identification training within that, so UK Biodiversity training. We've got some ideas on key priorities already. Uh, we'll be working with youth engagement, focusing on youth naturalists going forward, looking at diversity and inclusion, and using a mixture of online and face-to-face -face training, I guess. Um, we're really keen to hear from yourselves on where you think we should be prioritising our resources. So we're a big organisation, but like everyone else, resources really, we're really struggling for resources at the moment. We need to make sure we use it as effectively as we can. Um, so kind of, what are your priorities for us as a National Natural History Museum when it comes to training, promoting your work and supporting people to get involved in biological reporting? And there'll be a questionnaire, um, which I think is being handed to you on the way out. And I definitely need to get down from the stage. <laughs> Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Um, as we're already overrunning by at least 10 minutes, um, I don't think we've got time to do the Q&A, but I would really encourage you to go and talk to the speakers at lunchtime uh, and find out if you've got any burning questions for them or, for them or want to find anything more. Um, so now it is uh, lunch.